ideology is not only what it says, it's also the complex network of even solicited transgressions, you know. It, like in the army, I remember this, there were things which were prohibited, but they were things which you were expected to violate. If you didn't do it, you were an idiot. And this is, I've written a lot about it, maybe some of you know the language. This is for me the thing I mentioned yesterday evening worth studying. When you have a language or any community, rules of a community, it's never just you have rules. For theoretical reasons which can be nicely explained through the logic of non-all by Lacan and so on, you never have just rules. You always have, let's call them naively, meta-rules, which tell you how to treat rules. Which rules you are supposed even to violate and in what way. And things here get interesting, because you have two types of these unwritten rules. On the one hand, the usual type, rules which, for example, in the army, they told us, don't get drunk. If on Saturday and Sunday evening you were not drunk, you were considered an idiot. Not only an idiot, but even non-patriotic. You know, like, you are not a true comrade. You don't fraternize and so on. You know, this is a nice example of how drinking was prohibited, which strictly meant you have to do it to prove that you are really one of us, a soldier. So what interests me is, on the one hand, these rules which you are expected to violate, and a much more interesting phenomenon, on the other hand, you were allowed, solicited even, to do something, but you were expected not to use that opportunity. You know, like, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, there was a nice example, and I'm not dreaming, I am trying to answer your, you Stasi guys, yes, sorry, it's, uh, your question, you know, uh, 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 this is the life of ideology for me. For example, uh, uh, in the army, what fascinated me in the Yugoslav army is how openly it played this game of unwritten rules and so on. We had in the mornings military education, simply one hour, second hour. One morning, the first hour was more political education, quite on a chance, it was a miraculous coincidence that on that day, the officer was teaching us this uh, international Red Cross, whatever, rules, you know, do you know, maybe you know this, that there is a rule of warfare that you are not allowed to shoot a parachuter while he is still in the air. This is an international convention. You have to wait that he touches. Okay, we were taught this. Now, this was the miraculous coincidence. Next <coughs> class, next hour, was shooting a gun, and yes, you guessed it. The topic was how do you hit a parachuter in the air? You know, because you have to take into account the movement, uh, how the wind, and so on. And then I was a total idiot, total idiot that I am. I asked the officer, but sorry, sir, one hour ago you were thinking about this. Isn't there a contradiction here? And he gave me a right answer. He said, Vision, you're supposed to be a doctor. I didn't know you are such a complete idiot. So <laughs> don't explain like that. You know, it was simply a, 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 another. I'm sorry if you know this example, the one of military. If you know it, I will repeat. Probably most of this is. It happened to a friend of mine. He is a hero for me. This is the absolute example of this. You know, you are given a choice, but you. Are, uh, I don't know how it is if some of you served the army, but in Yugoslavia it was usual. You enter the barracks after a week of, or two of just introductory training, then the solemn moment arrives when you swear the oath. You know, the usual bullshit. I uh, swear solemnly that I'm ready to sacrifice my life for blah blah. And then after that public ritual, each soldier was forced to, forced, okay, expected, that's the catch, to sign his name. A friend of mine did a heroic thing. 
when he approached the table with the big book, he asked the officer, is this signature obligatory or not? The officer said, no. I mean, swearing an oath must be your free act. The soldier said, okay, then I don't do it. Then the officer said, fuck you, you will be arrested or whatever. Then the soldier said, but uh, wait a minute, you told me it's a free act and so on. So they shouted at each other and finally you know what was the result. And that's how I know it really happened. This soldier friend of mine got from the officer a piece of paper ordering him to freely sign the <laughs> And I'm, I'm not saying that Yugoslav army was especially totalitarian. I claim that uh, doesn't our love for our country, for our parents, it functions exactly in the same way. You are expected to love your parents, but you are expected to love them freely. Like, you know, this is the catch, I claim, of every uh, ideological field. So, back to my point. This is what interests me so much. These situations where you are given a certain choice, option, on condition that you don't use it. And uh, uh, I'm sorry if you know it, the, the big example, it was confirmed to me uh, by some historical books I read, was, <coughs> for example, in Stalinism. Officially, it was, of course, in Stalinist Russia, but the same could be said, right? It was prohibited to criticize Stalin. My God, you did this, you disappear next day. But it was even more prohibited, you see the catch, to publicly announce this prohibition. Like, sorry, maybe you know this joke of mine, my starter joke. Imagine we are now in Moscow, I'm Stalin, Central Committee meeting, one of you stands up and criticizes me. Okay, we know what will happen. Next day, the big talk among you would be who was the last to have seen that guy alive. No? But then let's imagine then another guy of you would have stood up and would start to shout at the first guy. Are you crazy? Don't you know that here we don't criticize Stalin? I claim that the first, the second guy would have disappeared even faster. You see the point? It was not only prohibited to criticize Stalin. The prohibition itself was prohibited. You had to pretend that, yes, if I want, I can, but simply Stalin is so good. You, you see this basic paradox. The prohibition itself is prohibited. You have to fake it. You have to act as if you are free, although you know that you are not free. And this is why I claim, here I sympathize with feminists who told me that uh, this is why the so-called postmodern master, you know, like today, male chauvinists are no longer direct chauvinists usually, you know, like shouting to your wife, okay, why didn't you do my socks, do this, that. No, they, they want to control things, but they pretend that, you know, we are all equal, blah, blah, blah. So the first step in feminism is it's almost subversive, you know. Let's, let's say you are married to a guy who is a male chauvinist, but covers this up by treating you, oh, we are just partners, all that bullshit. Maybe the most subversive thing to do, maybe, that's my point, even more subversive than directly rebelling, would have been to tell him, please, I'm your slave, treat me as a master. You know, this is why I, this may surprise you, I always loved them. Uh, my, okay, now I sound immediately up here. I uh, understand that, does this also happen with knowledge? Like, like, let me give you an example. Like, let's say, um, I don't know, uh, yesterday we were talking about the uh, sujet, suppose, yeah, yeah. right? So if I go to someone in the class and I say, uh, I perfectly know that you talk about the sujet, suppose, you yeah. ought to know, hmm? but if I say, uh, like a, uh, just as a gesture, you yeah. say, uh, does he speak about this? Yeah. You know, but we both know that. Oh, no, no, absolutely. I absolutely agree with you. This is crucial right. how, what things we are supposed to know, but supposed to pretend we don't know and so on. There is even, I will quote this in my new book, I found a book called 
agnotology or what something. It's really the science of unlearning. You know, it goes into, like, you know, it's like the, the book claims that we need not only epistemology, the science of knowing, but we also need a science of not knowing and different modalities of not knowing. For example, what does this mean ideologically? I spoke about this with Assange and I had to convince him he was too naive. I told him, but are you aware that all these Snowden and WikiLeaks uh, disclosures, what we learn are details, but basically, I mean, did we learn anything that we did not already suspect that it is happening? But we were just, your example, acting, we preferred not to know it. And that's the tragedy. The majority, even at some point, of Americans, their attitude was not, oh, horrible, what they were doing. No, their attitude was, we pretend not to know. Those in power have to do certain things discreetly. We pretend not to know it. And I claim the great achievement of, uh, no, I mean it extremely benevolently. No bad feeling from me, you guy with the cap. Go to your room and sleep. I'm not terrorizing you. No, no, I'm not sleeping. I'm just uncomfortable. Ah, sorry, because I really yeah. need, although, no, this is, I'm evil towards me, not to you. Yeah. Why don't you take a nice nap? I will try to speak with lower voice, and I promise you at the end we will awaken. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, I use this in my book, I think it's a defense of lost causes. You know, Alain Badiou, that's why he's my best friend. Maybe you know the story. He really did this to me once, even here, I think. It was a community like this. I had, at that point, or some shady political connection in Slovenia. I had a free cell phone. A political friend gave it to me. He said, this is a good cell phone. It works everywhere, all the connections. It's not to your name. Do whatever you want with it. It worked everywhere. And, uh, but you knew this. I, and he asked me to, uh, to, to, if he can borrow it from me. He was expecting an important call and so on. So, it was a talk like this, I was talking, he was sitting there, the phone rang, my phone even. He did it like this, not like, and then you know what he did? Isn't this a beautiful thing? At that point, we became absolute friends. Because as I wrote in my book, to do some, to someone this, you must either be an extremely brutal person, or it's absolute friendship. He, while I was talking, he interrupted me while I was talking and said, Slavoj, I have to talk on the phone. Could you please talk a little bit lower? <laughs> I mean, if there is a definition of absolute friendship, I this is, this mm -hmm. is it, no? Sorry, but, uh, so, I'm sorry, don't take it. I just, okay, okay, this chair is just uncomfortable. Yeah, I cannot, how to put it, whenever I see, you know, in Slovenia, there is almost a saying about me that when in any social situation, there is a slightless change, chance, opening for making a tasteless remark or whatever, I will do it. <laughs> I cannot scan situation and see the opening for a tasteless remark. Sorry, let's go on. This science of not knowing. Uh, yes, that... Uh, 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 so, again, I think that the sobering lesson of WikiLeaks is not so much secret services, that we ordinary people are no longer allowed to pretend that we don't know it. Because here comes my pessimist anthropology, if you want. I think most of the people don't want to know it. You have to... The, uh, uh, Lacan made some nice things, but Lacan ferociously opposes this notion of Wissenschaft, that there is ingrained deep in us some drive to know. No, Lacan like said basically, when you come to truly dramatic points, we don't want to know it. And I, in one of my political books, I go to the end and claim that even in a democracy, I doubt if we really want to decide, ordinary people. We want to maintain the appearance that we decide. But we want to be given a clear choice, you know, like, a master should tell us what we should choose freely. When we don't get a clear injunction what to choose, it's panic. 
It's usually real democracy. By this I mean where people really don't get a clear injunction and have to choose. It's usually experienced as a crisis of democracy. You know. So in this sense, I totally agree with you. There is a whole series types of not knowing. It's things that you really don't know. Then there are things that you don't know, there are then things which are simply prohibited. You should not know them. But then there are things that you have to know, but pretend uh, uh, not to know, and so on and so on. No? And yes, it would be nice to, to do uh, science, as it were, a science of this. So let's go back to, uh, to ideology. This is what fascinates me, you know. This uh, moment, uh, this, uh, how put it, this, uh, this uh, much more interesting than, than the solicitation, than the prohibition which really solicits you to do it, or the standard example in patriarchal societies. Father tells you don't mess with girls. Everyone knows the message between the lines, uh, do it but discreetly and so on.